Good afternoon again. We're going to go ahead and start um, our third talk of the afternoon. We have the pleasure of having with us Dr. Erwin Kovetz Kerman. Dr. Kovetz is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health and the Division of Cancer Prevention and Control of the University of Miami. She's also director of the Population Research Corps as chaired resource at the UM Cancer Center. She completed her PhD in public health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and her MPH at Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University. Her current research interests focus on understanding why minority and low-income persons shoulder a disproportionate burden of adverse breast and cervical cancer outcomes. Her research uses community-based participatory research methodologies to address racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic cancer outcome disparities. And today, she's going to be talking to us about addressing cancer disparity among Hispanics in Miami, lessons learned, and future challenges. Welcome. OK, so a few disclosures. I'm not speaking about Hispanics. I'm going to speak about Haitians. And um, I want to just say that even though I was trained in cancer epidemiology, I no longer identify as a cancer epidemiologist, which may or may not be the best fit for this particular group. I now identify as a community-based participatory researcher because in my tenure at the University of Miami and working collaboratively with the Haitian community there, um, I've come to realize how much my academic training inadequately prepared me to effectively address cancer disparity simply using the tools of cancer epidemiology. And so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, I want you to understand that it's not just my story. This is, I have the privilege of telling the story of a collaborative, an ongoing collaboration between the University of Miami and the Little Haiti community, which is the largest enclave of Haitian settlement in the United States. And I'm going to share data and lessons learned, some of which um, are very applicable to even large epidemiologic studies and to communities that are not Haitian. So people often ask me, um, how did you end up working in Little Haiti? You're a white girl who speaks very bad Creole. Um, <laughs> although, embarrassingly enough, my Creole is actually much better than my Spanish. Um, and basically what happened is this. I was recruited to the University of Miami about seven years ago. I am a Miami native, and I did like any good public health practitioner would do at the outset of my career, where I started to map the geographic distribution of certain so-called objective markers of health disparity throughout the Miami metropolitan area. And one of the ones that I was most focused and committed to was incidence of cervical cancer, because an excess incidence of that particular disease really speaks to the failure of our healthcare system to provide equitable opportunities for prevention and timely follow-up for detected abnormalities. And when I went through this exercise, there was this little area that lit up. There was actually a few of them. But this one in particular caught my attention because it was so incredibly geographically proximal to our school of medicine. And I thought, well, what is this area? So I actually got in my car and drove after identifying some cross streets. And I very quickly realized, given the predominance of Haitian Creole on many of the storefronts, that I was in Little Haiti. And I'm embarrassed to admit that being a Miami native, I had actually never been to Little Haiti before in my life that my only knowledge of this particular community dated back to the early days of the HIV AIDS epidemic when the CDC erroneously labeled Haitian ancestry as a risk factor for infection. And I remembered fuzzy TV images from my childhood where there was political protest at this labeling and on some level a legitimized dis discrimination of the Haitian community who I must tell you were already very much living on the margins of mainstream Miami. So just to give you a sense, this right here um, is Miami. <laughs> this is the University of Miami School of Medicine where I'm faculty, and this is Little Haiti. And the map doesn't do much justice in sharing that Little Haiti is about five miles from the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Despite this proximity, um, Little Haiti is a federally designated medically underserved area, which suggests that there's a shortage of primary care providers within Little Haiti to offset the primary care needs of adults and children living within this particular community. And so I really believe that there's an obligation and opportunity, or there was an obligation and opportunity on the behalf of the university to try to work collaboratively with key stakeholders in Little Haiti to address this disparity in a way that was meaningful, meaning that it reflects community needs and interest. The other map that I show here is something that um, 
happened early on in my partnership with the Little Haiti community where the red boundaries reflect what Little Haiti re represented traditionally and the yellow boundaries represent what key stakeholders through a process called consensus mapping identified Little Haiti to be today. And what you notice from the map is that Little Haiti today is much smaller than Little Haiti was traditionally. And the shrinkage of boundaries reflects some ongoing gentrification that's actually happening at Little Haiti's borders. And the Little Haiti community has been largely unable to raise a political voice of significant emphasis to stop this gentrification and hold on to the sociocultural significant place that Little Haiti represents. So Little Haiti is oftentimes the first stop in the migration experience of many Haitians coming from Haiti to the United States. And even many Haitians who still reside in the Miami metropolitan area choose to move out of Little Haiti once they get on better economic footing. But despite that, Little Haiti is one of the most socioculturally significant spaces in the Haitian diaspora. And it goes without saying that the dislo dislocation of people from a space of sociocultural significance serves to further disenfranchise them, certainly from certain services to which I would argue they are entitled. The other thing that's really important about this map, and I think is something that we often overlook in epidemiology, is that if you were to stage an intervention for the Haitian community in Little Haiti without having done this process of community mapping, you might decide to open a pap smear clinic here. And what I'd argue is that if you were to do that, that there might be a mismatch between your intent and meeting the needs of the community. So let me tell you about Little Haiti. So Little Haiti, as I suggested earlier, is the largest enclave of Haitian settlement in the United States. Most people living there are recent immigrants, meaning they've come to the United States in the past five to 10 years. Generally, residents of Little Haiti, at least as characterized by census data, are considered to be poor, undereducated. Many of them have limited proficiency in English and Spanish, which are the two predominant languages spoken within Miami. And as I already told you, they're very much disenfranchised from the formal healthcare system. Now, all of these issues remain even bigger challenges since the earthquake in Haiti that happened three years ago. So what about cancer disparity in little Haiti? I told you that I did mapping, right? So what I found through this mapping exercise and then some other analyses that I did with the help of the Florida Cancer Data System, which is the incident, the incident, cancer, incident cancer registry for the state of Florida, was that the incidence of cervical cancer in Little Haiti is estimated to be 38 per 100,000, relative to about nine per 100,000 for other blacks living both within Miami, the state of Florida, and the United States as a whole. Now, this represents a pretty significant disparity that, again, really requires some serious research and intervention to understand the etiology of that disparity and to come up with solutions to address it. Again, this area is less than five miles from a very large school of medicine and is almost four times higher than what is reported anywhere else in the metropolitan area. It's much more consistent with actually what's been observed in the developing world. So when I came to the University of Miami, or actually after I found this data, I tried to engage some of my senior colleagues in a dialogue about what they thought accounted for this disparity. And I can't tell you how many people dissuaded me from trying to pursue inquiry to understand and address it. Now, part of that um, skepticism on their part really had to do with concerns about my professional viability and tenurability. But part of it had to do with the way that we in the United States really conceptualize cancer surveillance and the role of race in cancer disparity. So as many of you probably know that we tend to group people into large categories based on some sort of shared identity, race being one of the most important. And so anybody with a shared phenotype of black is lumped into one category for research and surveillance purposes. And I would argue that in a multicultural context like Miami, that this practice is very, very pathetic, for lack of a better word, because what happens is that it masks our ability to identify variability that exists within racial ethnic groups and to understand the loc to identify the locus of disparity and then to do research to attenuate it. So this is one reason that we were not able or my, my senior colleagues were not so stoked about me trying to pursue research in Little Haiti is that they had not really thought about 
race as a social and not a biological construct. And many of them were quite happy to sort of reinstitutionalize a practice by which we were not critically examining race and how we were collecting data around race and ethnicity as part of cancer surveillance. The other thing is that there were lots of barriers to research within the Little Haiti community. And so let me spend some time talking about, about these barriers and how they affected my ability to employ traditional cancer epidemiology. One, there was a general distrust of outsiders. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Haitian community in Miami, but it is a community that has really been margin marginalized systematically over time. And this marginalization has led to sort of a healthy skepticism about, about people who are not part of the community, and particularly about people who are affiliated with authoritative institutions, such as the University of Miami. Why? Because people are really worried that in engaging with somebody from the University of Miami that it may pose risk to their immigration status or to that of a loved one. And so people were not so inclined to participate in research because they thought by disclosing personal information that somehow it would be linked to their ability to stay in the United States. Number two, predominance of monolingual Creole speakers. So Creole is a language but for a very long time, it was simply a dialect. And the orthography for Creole was only recently developed, meaning that many older Haitians do not read or write Creole. And because within Haiti, the system of education is not public, oftentimes parents have to choose which, if any of their children, go to school. So even within the younger generation of recent immigrants, many of them do not read or write Creole. So what does this mean? This poses real challenge to, to traditional epidemiology when we tend to rely on large surveys, many of which are mailed, and assume a level, level of literacy and health literacy. With this particular community, that strategy would not work. Okay. The other thing about monolingual Creole speakers is that if you have a bunch of people who are functionally illiterate, it really poses challenge not just to the research process, but how you go about thinking about health education. Because it means that you can't just offer up a brochure that says, get a pap smear, it's important. That you have to be able to, one, identify culturally relevant communication channels, but two, be able to convey messages in a way that resonate with people, both in their dialect of choice, but also with regard to their literacy level. Okay. Number three, dissonance between Haitian and Western medicine's conceptualization of health and prevention. So this was the most eye-opening to me, and this is when I started, I think, to retract a little bit from traditional epidemiology. Probably many of us in this room privilege biomedicine, right? Most of us believe in the concept of germ theory. In Little Haiti, what I came to understand is that there was much more of a pluralistic understanding of health and disease prevention, one which blended biomedicine with more lay interpretations of disease. One of these lay interpretations is humoral theory. Humoral theory is very popular in, in Haiti and also within other Caribbean nat nations. And humoral theory really speaks to the need to achieve balance in the humors in order to be healthy. From that perspective, from the perspective of humoral theory, something like pap smear screening doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it's also important to understand this when thinking about asking questions and how we frame questions to solicit the responses that inform our understanding of a phenomenon of interest. So if I were to ask a Haitian woman, do you practice prevention? She might say yes. But what she thinks and what I think are not the same thing. I'm thinking she went and got a pap smear every year from the age of 21 or when she became sexually active. And she's often thinking about drinking teas or taking certain baths that help her achieve balance in her humors. So again, this is really important to know. Last but not least, I mentioned this earlier on in my talk. I mentioned um, during the early onset of the HIV AIDS epidemic that Haitian ancestry was erroneously labeled as a risk factor for transmission. Now, the research which documented an increased prevalence of HIV among Haitians actually came from the University of Miami. The research itself was not bad. It was good epidemiologic research. The way the data were manipulated by the media was very bad, particularly for the Haitian community, who to this day will say they've never been able to effectively live down the stigma of being associated with the disease process. So to circumvent these barriers, um, 
I had an employer methodology that somewhat turns traditional epidemiology and traditional research epistemology on its head. And this methodology is known as community-based participatory research. From here on forward, I will refer to it to CBPR. And what CBPR is, is an innovative approach to research that's getting increasing traction within medicine, public health, and nursing, as well as some other disciplines, where community members are invited to participate at all phases of the research process from conceptualization of the idea to implementation to dissemination of findings. And by inviting community members to be part of the research process, you really bridge the chasm between the researcher and the research, and you inspire a process of co-learning whereby there's an ongoing bi-directional dialogue between community members and academic investigators in a way that should enable the marrying of academic resources with community strength. And through this process, we develop something that we call partner in action or partners in action. This campus community partnership, just as a bit of background, has now been together for about six and a half, seven years. And through our collaborative efforts, we've garnered over $15 million of, of extramural support from the National Cancer Institute to collaboratively, under, to collaboratively work towards understanding why Haitian women contribute to excess cervical cancer incidents and to come up with solutions to address it. So one of the things that I would argue about CBPR, and I think we CBPR does this better than a lot of other more traditional methodologies, um, I borrow this slide from Jeffrey Rose, <laughs> who wrote about the paradox of prevention. And um, this is actually something that I teach all the time, which is that when you focus, when you work with a community, the emphasis tends to be on community risk conditions and not individual risk factors. So as a result, you identify those risk conditions and, and address them, you're able to shift the distribution of risk for the entire community, regardless of an individual's particular propensity for developing disease. And so that's what CBPR does. It naturally focuses emphasis on the social determinants that affect all people within a given community, not just individuals who may be uniquely predisposed to an increased likelihood of developing or dying of a certain disease. And so in this way, even though our our work has been focused thus far on cervical cancer, we've also built capacity to address other issues for which there are preventive strategies, some of which can be aligned with the Haitian conceptualization of health and disease. So what does this mean in Little Haiti, CBPR? How do we operationalize it? Um, community members really define the focus and scope of all research. They come up with what we study, and then the academic investigators come up with strategies how to answer the research questions. The community then chooses which of those strategies they believe to be most appropriate given their unique understanding of community concerns and cultural constraints. Community members never wanted anything to do with IRB. Um, they were not so inspired by contributing to academic journals, although in the publications that we've produced, there is always at least one or two community members who serves as an author or co-author. Um, they wanted to ensure that dissemination happened locally and through media channels that were actually relevant to them. So what does this mean? Anytime we finish a study or in the process of a study, we have a huge community forum where anybody from the community can come and comment on our data and provide us real critical feedback and insight about what we've identified and how to move it forward in a way that advances health and, he and health equity. The other thing is that we use things like radio to talk about the results and to generate a conversation about research that helps to undo some of the skepticism that is really prevalent within Little Haiti even today through this process of collaboration. Um, the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that one of the goals of CBPR is really to build local capacity to support research and and intervention, and so to accomplish this end, it really means investing significant dollars into the community. And so anytime we get funding from the National Institutes of Health, um, the community partners select one community-based organization to serve as the community home for the research. And being the community home or primary subcontract, that organization gets about 40 to 50% of the grant dollars, and they then are responsible for hiring and supervising the community health workers who play an integral role in our data collection efforts. <laughs> um, community health workers have been very key to all the work that we've done and I'm going to talk about um, next. 
Community leaders advocated for integ integrating them into our research design very early on. This is a bit of a change from how community health workers have been traditionally implemented within the field of public health, where they tend simply to use social networks and to mobilize those social networks as a way to disseminate health information. In this work, what we did is we actually trained the community health workers to do the research. So they were responsible for recruiting participants, collecting study data, and we're really integral in terms of the dissemination of findings. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our work in cervical cancer. All of this was guided by the community. It actually re reflects their conceptualization. I'm going to talk about where we started and interspersed lessons throughout. So early on in Little Haiti, one of the first things the community partners wanted to know was whether Haitian women were getting screened by pap smear at the same rate as other black women in the Miami metropolitan area. So my Haitian colleagues had a hunch that this practice of lumping everybody together was telling an inaccurate story for Haitian women. And that inaccurate story, which, which implied that black women were being screened at the same, if not higher, rates than their white counterparts, was precluding the availability of resource designation for the Haitian community. And so they were actually on to something. So what we did is we collected 1,000 surveys, or the community health workers collected 1,000 surveys. They used what is called rapid assessment surveys, where they would approach women in community venues throughout, my, throughout Little Haiti. They would ask them if they met study eligibility criteria, which in this case was 40 years of age and older. And they would ask them about their PAP they're, no, sorry, this, in this one, it was 21 years of age and older, and they'd ask them about their pap smear screening history. And what we found here was that Haitian women were far less likely than blacks and whites to be screened by regular pap smear. And the emphasis on regular pap smear is very important. Why? Because it's not one time or sporadic screening that confers a benefit in terms of mortality. It's regular screening throughout the life course. And this was the first study to our knowledge that actually demarcated that this different ex difference existed and really spoke to the need to have targeted screening initiatives that focused on the Little Haiti community. Because even though other black women in Miami were being screened, this particular group of black women was not being screened. So one of the things that we learned through this, though, was actually very, very important. So when we started doing this work, there was an advent of a lot of new technology. Um, now you could use something like an iPad, but back then it was actually a PDA. Anyone remember those? <laughs> And we felt really strongly that if we arm the community health workers with this technology, that we would really limit the possibility of data loss or any issues related to data entry after all 1,000 rapid assessment surveys were collected. And so we sent initially the community health workers out into the field with these little PDAs, and they would approach people in the venues with the PDA front and center. What we came to learn very, very quickly was that this approach, while very good for research, was not very good for the Haitian community, or at least engendering goodwill about research for the Haitian community. Why? Well, SK, we in INS? Are you INS? <laughs> so what was happening was, at the same time that we were initiating this research process in Little Haiti, INS was like in the streets and knocking on people's doors, trying to identify who was within my, who was in Little Haiti legally and who was there illegally. And they always used a computer. So the association of the community health workers with INS really posed dilemma to the research process. And so what we had to do, given lots of community feedback about the skepticism of anyone carrying a PDA to collect data, was to back off of technology and really return to the traditional me method of paper and pen. So after we found that Haitian women were not being screened by pap smear, it became very important to ask why, right? Because it wasn't just enough to know that they weren't being screened. We had to identify why they weren't being screened. And we started this process through a series of focus groups and in ethnographic interviews. So again, this is mixed methodology where we really engaged Haitian women in a meaningful dialogue about their barriers to cervical cancer prevention and how potentially we could address such barriers through intervention. So, um, we published this really fancy model. This is grounded theory. It emerged from all of these interviews where we were able to you know, identify certain determinants, some of which were things that we could do nothing about, some of which were actual levers for change. And I'm going to talk a little bit about all of them. But before I do that, OK. So one of the first lessons we learned was um, this issue of health literacy and this issue of Creole not being 
a language that was equitably spoken or read, not equitably read by everybody within the community. And this really posed challenge to thinking about how to raise the level of literacy around cervical cancer and other diseases in a way that was culturally relevant, community-based, and literacy appropriate. And the other thing that I should say is that in speaking with women over time, one of the things that we realize actually through the process of doing informed consents, and this is really important, is that just because you translate an instrument or an informed consent form from English to Creole and then back translate it to English doesn't necessarily mean that it's culturally consonant to the women that you're trying to engage in research. Okay, so what does that mean? Like there may be a word in Creole for whatever you're trying to convey in English, but just because that word exists doesn't mean that it actually makes sense to the people who you're trying to in to have participate in research, okay? So this raised some real ethical concerns for us and also from the pr perspective of health education made us think really critically about how to engage the community in a process of developing educational tools that were not just based on written word alone. So one of the things the community really argued for was the development of a flip chart. And I was thinking, oh gosh, like really? <laughs> This is, this is, can't we do better than this? This is, you know, 2000. But no, we couldn't do better than this because this is what the community wanted. And had we tried any other strategy, we probably wouldn't have been as effective in, in coming up with educational materials that resonated with community needs and interests. So these are images from the flip chart that were developed by a, a local artist in the style of Art La Naif, which is very popular in, in Haiti. And we had many local Haitian women comment on the very iter various iterations of the flip chart from its earliest design to what was ultimately put into the field. And so we had women tell us like, no, we don't want to look so skinny. Put some earrings on us. Um, we like to get dressed up, especially when we go to the doctor. Oh no, don't show it, don't show it here. No one would talk about cervical cancer in the grocery smart. You have to show it here. And when you have women in a kitchen, there should always be something on the stove. I mean, we got that kind of detailed insight from the community and that was really important because then when we put these images forth, this was something that the women themselves resonated with and because of that, they were much more inclined to listen to what the story that was being told. And just sort of as an example was, in Creole, there's no word for cervix. There's lots of different words, that all, of, all of which sort of approximate the anatomical significance of the cervix, but no real word for cervix itself. So how do you start having a conversation about cervical cancer if there isn't a word? So one of the things that we had to do was actually help people identify what their cervix was, and we did this through pregnancy. So this, the womb is the place where the baby grows during pregnancy. The bottom of the womb is called the cervix. The cervix is what opens up to allow the baby to pass from the womb to the vagina during delivery. The other thing that women didn't really understand was cancer. Well, how do you talk about cancer or cancer if people don't even understand what it is or why it has relevance for their health? One of the earliest things I learned in Little Haiti um, was through dialogue with a community stakeholder who said, in Haiti, no one worries about cervical cancer. You only worry about that when you come to the United States. In Haiti, people just die because they die. And then another woman followed that by saying, well, no, no, we do know about cervical cancer in Haiti. Cervical cancer is that disease you know, you get, you discharge, you bleed, you discharge, you bleed, 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 die. So people's understanding of cancer was not the kind of understanding that we would want to promote from a cancer prevention and control perspective. And so we really needed to offer people the opportunity to understand what cancer was on its most basic level, which is that all parts of the body, including the cervix, are made up of cells. In most instances, these cells function healthy. Sometimes things happen within the cell that change the way that the cell behaves. And if these changes happen are left unchecked over time, these cells can develop a lump or mass that can be detected on physical exam. And if that lump or mass is not appropriately treated, it can travel to other parts of the body where it can have real implications for health and, and quality of life. Now this picture is um, a picture of a self-sampling device and I'm gonna talk about that too. <laughs> 
The other thing we learned in thinking about why women were not getting screened by pap smear um, was something that kind of blew my mind. Because early on, my assumption, and it was simply an assumption, was that women were not getting screened by pap smear because there was just no access to it, right? Little Haiti was a federally designated medically underserved area, and when I spent time in Little Haiti, I could not identify one venue where women could go to get free or low-cost screening. In order to access that within Little Haiti, you actually had to travel some pretty significant distance using public transportation, which is not always so easy to navigate within Miami, often engaging with a healthcare provider who did not speak Creole and who could not really communicate to you effectively about why the pap smear was important or follow up with you in a timely manner if you had results that indicated other medical procedure. So when I started talking to Haitian women about cervical cancer, I came to realize that my assumption was wrong, that even for women who had access to the healthcare system and who, for whom pap smear screening was theoretically available, many of them did not want to get a pap smear because a pap smear was not an acceptable method or strategy for prevention. And so what women would tell me is, well, I don't want that speculum put into my vagina because when that happens, like the tone or rigidity of my vagina is going to change and it's going to become looser, or flaccid and I'm no longer going to be sexually desirable to my male partner. And by the way, I'm financially dependent on him. Or, you know, when the speculum gets introduced into the vagina, there's the risk of gauze getting trapped there. And gauze causes disease. So why would I do something that's going to make me unhealthy? Or cervical cancer has malady mo. It's, it's a sense sickness. It comes from supernatural origin. There's nothing you can do to prevent it. And if you get it, you're going to die. There were many women who told me that the way that people got cervical cancer, that women got cervical cancer, is because that woman's boyfriend's girlfriend put powder in his underwear that he then brought home to her when they had sex. Well, they weren't completely wrong, right? Because HPV is a sexually transmitted infection. So maybe the husband's girlfriend actually had HPV, which then he brought home to his wife. But from this perspective, that cervical cancer is a malady mo. That cognitive framework is very dissonant with the notion of cervical cancer prevention. And it's within this cognitive framework, right or wrong, that if we want to achieve health equity, we must work and work effectively. So community members said, now you know, we're not going to open a pap smear shop. No one's going to come. What do we do? So I said, well, I don't know. What do we do? <laughs> and what they came up with was this notion of self-sampling for human papillomavirus. One of them had worked closely with an academic colleague at, a po at, a, at another point who was actually talking about self-sampling. And their goal was to see if we could arm community health workers with a self-sampling device that they then could take to their social networks and engage women who needed to be screened in at-home screening. And self-sampling circumvents many of these sociocultural barriers to pap smear prevention because it's something that women can do at home. It doesn't affect the tone or rigidity of the vagina. And it allows women the privacy that many of them seek. So early on, we did a little study about the acceptability and feasibility of self-sampling. And what we found was that self-sampling was, self was overwhelmingly acceptable. And what's not really represented in this data, but I'd like to share with you, is that when our community health workers showed up to women's houses to self-sample a woman that they had already arranged a mutually agreeable time and location with, they turned into self-sampling parties because the women had invited their mothers and their aunts and their cousins and their friends to come because many of them wanted the opportunity to engage in prevention, but they hadn't had the opportunity to do so in a way that reflected and honored their cultural perspectives on health. The other thing that's really interesting about doing self-sampling is that it gave us the first inkling of, as what was happening with regard to the prevalence of HPV in this particular community. Because it wasn't just access to care, although that is the biggest part of the equation in Little Haiti, but we had a suspicion that maybe within Little Haiti there was a higher than expected prevalence of human papillomavirus. And prior to doing self-sampling, that community was completely closed to the possibility of biospecimen exchange. And it was only through the mutual trust and respect and integration of community partners in the research process that we were able, ably actual, 
actually able to garner biospecimens that could be tested for HPV and give us some understanding of how the virus was playing out within this particular context. And what's shown on this table is what we saw, and it's very confusing, is um, that there was a higher than expected prevalence of HPV among older Haitian women, women who are 30 to 50 years of age. And that speaks to perhaps persistent or re-emergent infection. And within a context like Little Haiti, where women are not being screened for cervical cancer, basically it's the perfect storm for cancer disparity to be institutionalized over time. The other thing that we learned was that there was a unique type distribution of HPV within Little Haiti, and this all needs to be vetted further and is being vetted much further through retrospective analyses looking at tumor specimens of Haitian women, cervical tumor specimens of Haitian women, and subtyping them and seeing whether the HPV types that we found within this particular population is reflective of what's happening within carcinogenesis. Because I don't really care if you have a unique type distribution of HPV within the population if it's not contributing to carcinogenesis. And so we're trying to figure this out. But what I will tell you is that if that plays out in, in the way that we anticipate, it really might speak to the, to the need to develop new therapeutics and vaccines for this particular population who is shouldering the excess burden of cervical cancer, not just in Miami, but within the Western Hemisphere. Now, the other thing that I came to learn in working with Haitian women is that Haitian women go to great lengths to practice feminine hygiene, which they believe reduces the risk of disease. So this came about after years and years of working in Little Haiti when women, I think, finally trusted me enough to be honest about this. And they shared with me a practice known as Toilette de Ba. And Toilette de Ba um, is an intervaginal, it's intervaginal cleansing that young girls are taught um, very early as a way to maintain hygiene. But then the practice itself sort of takes on a new life as women hit menarche and sexual activity. And it's not just intervaginal washing for hygiene. It becomes intervaginal washing as a way to achieve the ideal clima or climate of the vagina that male partners themselves find to be sexually preferable. And Toilette de Ba involves the use of commercial and herbal products, some of which are known carcinogens. Um, it also involves monthly use of antibiotics as part of the menstrual cycle. So in Little Haiti, many women can get ampicillin monthly at uh, area botanicas, and they take it for the first three days of the period because the period is thought to be dirty. The release of blood is thought to be dirty, and they do this as a way to reduce the risk of infection both for themselves and their partners. And I don't need to tell you that when you take antibiotics, it changes the floor of the vagina in such a way that it predisposes women to other infections, some of which may be cofactors when HPV is introduced in the cervix to facilitate the process of carcinogenesis. So. When women told me about this, we started doing some real ethnographic work to try to um, identify all of and catalog all of the products that women were using and then to understand how they were using them. And we came up with a whole list of things. I want you to pay attention to this. Poacon Go is the pigeon pea. Does that grow in Puerto Rico? Yes. OK. It's my most favorite food. OK? I want you to pay attention to this. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead. Because when we control for all other risk factors associated with HPV, we see an increased risk of HPV among women who report routine intervaginal washing with Pwakongo. And the odds of HPV are three times higher. Okay, So this is an important part of the etiologic puzzle, potentially. And what it meant was it necessitated some real interdisciplinary collaboration with some of our, our basic science colleagues who started to expose um, cervical epithelial cell lines to, um, to the products in the way that women said that they prepared them. And when they did that, and they exposed the, the cell lines to the products ex exactly the way a woman said they used them, guess what? It induced immediate apoptosis. So at the very least, these products are killing the first line, the cervix's first line of defense, leaving the basement membrane completely exposed to HPV. That's one. But when we expose Pwakongo to cervical cells, some of which were infected with HPV, it caused unregulated cell growth. And I don't think I need to tell this audience that unregulated cell growth of HPV-infected cells is certainly not 
a good thing. And so now I'm actually working with an ethnopharmacologist. We've done a bunch of microarray analyses, and we're trying to understand on a cellular level how Qualcomm Go is working with E6 and E7 to turn on and turn off cellular processes that may actually be important for understanding, one, how HPV gets integrated into the genome, and two, how HPV induces carcinogenesis for these particular women. Okay, I'm not going to talk about colorectal cancer. We just don't have time. So, um, so I, I've told you a story, and I told you some of the lessons that I learned as part of this story, and I hope that it causes all of us to take a pause and think about the importance of engaging the, re engaging the community and research, even research that starts in a laboratory. I think all of us probably need to really step back and think about what role does this research have for the community. If you're doing biomarker discovery for bladder cancer, hopefully the goal is not just to advance the discovery of new biomarkers or how those biomarkers are variable between different populations, but to think about how those biomarkers may lead to new screening technologies that can be implemented within communities. So we all need to be thinking about communities. I don't think that anyone in this room or more than one or two people in this room are going to be community-based participatory researchers who are going to invest their career in working collaboratively with the community to identify strategies that may lead to health equity. But one of the things that I would argue is that when we do cancer research, that we have the goal of community competence in mind. So oftentimes what we talk about is cultural competence and this need to sort of understand the cultural beliefs that people bring to healthcare encounters. I would argue that through my work with the Little Haiti community, it's not just about culture. It's about the intersection of culture, politics, immigration, language, and race and ethnicity, and it's all of those things that we only learn in working with communities that really advance our ability to ask questions that have real meaning for understanding and addressing health equity. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks again for a wonderful presentation. Now we're gonna go ahead and go for the last presentation of the afternoon. We have the honor of having with us Dr. Paulo Pinheiro. He's a trained, uh, resident physician in Portugal, completed his Master's of Science in Holland and his PhD in Miami. He was also a fellow at the Descriptive Epidemiology Department at, at ERC in France. His main research interest is in the area of cancer epidemiology. Particular interests are cancer among Hispanic Latinos, population-based cancer survival, and the study of, the, of second neoplasms. He recently worked, his recent work has focused on improving the recognition of Hispanic ethnicity among recorded cancer cases, as well as subgroups of the Hispanics population in the United States. And also he's interested in the changes of risk when Hispanics migrate to the US. And today he's gonna to be talking to us about the Hispanic paradox, uh, particularly in the area of cancer. And he, it's very interesting for us that he's also gonna be using Puerto Rico as an example. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> so, it's a great honor to be here. I'm very thankful to um, Dr. Suarez's team, but it's going to be a Herculean task now to match uh, Dr. Kobitz. Uh, very interesting. <laughs> so I've, uh, I ask you to bear with me. It's going to be a lot of numbers, unfortunately. Okay, so let's start. Um, I'm going to be talking about cancer and Hispanic paradox, and uh, there is a um, uh, analysis that I did in the end on purpose for this um, for this conference, which is about Puerto Ricans in particular. Um, so I will be talking very generally on the epidemiology of cancer in Hispanics, what we have in terms of major indicators, in terms of incidence, survival, some of the methodological issues that uh, I'm sure uh, my, um, the people who invited me will be very interested in as well. And then the last part of my presentation is going to focus on the analysis on colorectal cancer survival data that I was able to gather from different registries and what the impact would be in terms of the different Hispanic subgroups. So we all know this. Uh, I, I was jet lagged, so I, was, I didn't have the opportunity to come in the morning, but I'm sure everybody has spoken about this uh, before. Hispanics in the US, the fastest growing minority in the US, it's now 17% of the whole population is, uh, is Hispanic. And although Hispanics in general share a common language and an immigration experience, uh, and also a culture, to, a culture with attitudes and values that are different from the mainstream uh, 
English language culture, they are very heterogeneous from the cultural, socioeconomic, and genetic perspectives. And this has been one of the main interests in terms of my research, is that within Hispanics, we've got different uh, subgroups. And uh, in terms of research and in terms of cancer, it's important to study those different subgroups. So basically, there is a wide variety of national, ethnic, and cultural subpopulations that uh, are interesting to research in terms of cancer epidemiology in the US. Now we can see here the major groups, the Mexicans, the Puerto Ricans, the Cubans, and the Central and South Americans. And we can see, if you go to the census data, for instance, that they all differ a little bit uh, between the different groups in terms of education, in terms of access to health care, in terms of household income, and in terms even of race and probably genetically comp genetic composition a little bit. So for instance, if you look at access to Medicare and Medicaid, we can clearly see that Puerto Ricans and Cubans by virtue of their own status in the country, they've got much more access to all the public programs of Medicaid and Medicare compared to, for instance, either Mexicans or South and Central Americans, which have low access. If you look at the average of the education level for each of the Hispanic subgroups, they're also quite different with uh, South Americans, for instance, with a high level of education, Cubans with a medium, whereas the other ones will be lower than average. So I'm sure we all identify with this and with the heterogeneity of all these uh, determinants of uh, outcomes in terms of cancer, both in terms of incidence and in terms of survival. The main context of my presentation is the Hispanic paradox, and I am sure that everybody here has heard of the Hispanic paradox. The Hispanic paradox is a term that was coined in 1986 by this gentleman, Kyriakos Markidis, from University of Texas Medical Branch. And the first definition that he came up with was that there was a low mortality among Latinos in the United States compared to non-Hispanic whites, and then that that was unusual given that Latinos have a lower average income and education. So there are two points to this definition. <laughs> this definition is a little bit vague um, and unfortunately has been transported to many, many other concepts and health outcomes uh, in, the in the entire United States. Because you see, one of the things is, sorry, it focuses on mortality. Mortality by itself in epidemiology is very uh, complicated, as we're going to see. And the other thing is, okay, it's low mortality, but it's related to this fact that for Latinos, there is a lower average income and education. So it's very difficult to actually prove such, uh, such um, uh, such postulates in a real research study because it's always got this relationship inside. So at the individual level, it's very, very difficult. Now, the Hispanic paradox has been subject to many, uh, re to much research out there, and there have been all these theories as to why the Hispanic paradox exists. One of them is the barrio advantage. So among Hispanics, more stable family structures, community institutions that are beneficial to the individual health, especially for the elderly when they have a declining physical uh, function. And also that the barrio advantage would shield them from the effects of assimilation in American culture. We're talking about not the context of Puerto Rico, of course, we're talking about the context of the US mainland. Now, overall, what we would say is that the advantages outweigh these advantages of the barrier would outweigh in some way or another the concentrated eye poverty that we found, unfortunately, in many states across uh, the United States among Hispanic neighborhoods. Now we can see that acculturation is a very complex uh, uh, concept. It doesn't have exactly to do with language, but uh, it's got to do with uh, the balance between, sorry, the balance between Hispanic culture and the Anglo culture. So there are some people who are totally isolated from the American culture uh, in the US, and those would be, for instance, in this quadrant, whereas there are those that are totally assimilated in the American uh, society, and sometimes they even strip themselves off of uh, Hispanic self-identification, etc. So we find the whole spectrum in terms of acculturation. Acculturation has been the subject of many studies, and there are negatives and positives about acculturation. Most of the evidence in terms of risk factors for cancer, in terms of acculturation, unfortunately, are negative. So studies have found that there are higher rates of substance abuse, illicit drug, alcohol, and smoking when Latinos migrate to the United States, that the diet and nutrition uh, tends to be poor, although that might not apply for Puerto Ricans, for instance, uh, less fruits, less vegetables, and protein, more fat. 
higher rates of mental illness, depression, and suicide. So there's nothing good about this, and these are the negative aspects of a phenomenon as complex as acculturation. Uh, another one that I found that was very interest, interesting was the increased distress associated with alienation, discrimination, and Mexican-Americans attempting to adma- advance themselves economically and socially, stripping themselves of traditional resources and ethnically-based social support. So in other words, if you want to succeed in America, it's good for you to strip yourself of the Hispanic heritage, but then you're going to suffer the consequences in terms of the health advantage that you could have. Um, very interesting concept. Anyway. It's not all negative, there are positives to acculturation as well, and those tend to be more with barriers to care. People have got more access, more access to high quality health care, uh, they use more preventive services. So it's not at all bad. So basically, in this context of the Hispanic paradox and what we know in terms of the numbers and what's happening in terms of uh, cancer epidemiology in uh, US Latinos. Is there an Hispanic paradox in cancer? That's the question of my presentation. Well, when we talk about population-based cancer epidemiology, there are three main indicators that that we think about. One of them is incidence, or the risk of getting cancer. Survival, once one gets cancer, how long is that person going to survive? Or if, unfortunately, there is a fatal outcome. And then mortality, which is dying from cancer. Now, as I said before, mortality is very complex because it's basically a result of incidence and survival. So if you have a very rare cancer in which the survival is very, very low, then what you're going to have is low mortality just because of the fact that the incidence is low. So what I do is I'm not going to talk about mortality. Very complex, uh, lots of confounding factors in there. I'm going to talk about incidence and survival and what is the evidence that we have so far. So the part one, can we talk about Hispanic paradox in incidence. We probably can. Why? Because incidence rates have provenly been uh, uh, found to be about 30% compared to non-Hispanic whites. And this is when we talk about U- US Hispanics as a whole. Now, there, are, there is higher incidence for some infection-related cancers for most of the Hispanic subgroups, and we're all familiar with those. Stomach, liver, and cervix, they are associated with infections, and they tend to be uh, more common among uh, US Hispanics. However, when we do all these numbers, the diversity of Hispanics is totally ignored. So for each of the Hispanic subgroups, there are actually um, a lot of differences that are important to address. And that's what I did at the time of my PhD at the University of Miami. Uh, And this is my first slide over the cancer incidence. So one of the things that we see here is When we look at SEER 17, SEER is the gold standard for incidence rates of cancer in the United States, what we see is when we separate them by race, whites, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians, here Hispanics are considered separately than this, uh, what we see is that whites and blacks have got higher cancer rates and Hispanics and Asians have got lower cancer rates. But one particular feature that is very interesting here and that we should put in the context of the Hispanic paradox as well is that the proportion of foreign-born is very, very different, okay? 4% for whites, 7% for blacks, 40% for Hispanics, and 66% for Asians. As you probably all have uh, realized uh, or heard of, there is this concept of the uh, healthy immigrant effect in the way that uh, people who come and immigrate to this country tend to be healthier on average uh, compared to the United States population, okay? So in some sense, there might be a strong influence of these numbers in the cancer incidence rates uh, that we have in this country. In other words, when we have immigration, not only we're importing good workers, we're also importing low risks of cancers, which is great for the nation, okay? It gets our numbers all all nice. Um, Now, my focus when I did my PhD in Miami was actually to study the cancer incidence in every single Hispanic subgroup. And Florida is great for many things, but one of them is for their data. They are the only state in the United States that have got all the Hispanic subgroups in enough numbers that we can study, okay? And epidemiology, as you know, is all about numbers. If you don't have the numbers, you don't get anywhere. Okay, so what we see here is we did some estimation. Very complicated. This is just um, a summary of what we found. We found that whites and blacks, as suspected, they've got higher incidence rates compared to Hispanics. Hispanics are the yellow uh, bar. But within Hispanics, look at the differences. They're all different, okay? 
the pooling thing for the Hispanics numbers are really the Mexicans. The Mexicans are the ones with the lowest rates of cancer. But they are 65% of the Hispanic population, so guess what? The total is, very, is low and is highly beneficial for uh, Hispanics. When you do Puerto Ricans and Cubans, unfortunately, they fare worse than all the other groups. Okay? So you've got the Mexicans, the New Latins. New Latins are all the others, South and Central Americans. And what you see is Puerto Ricans and Cubans have got higher cancer rates. This works for males. And this works for females as well. Again, the same thing, Puerto Ricans and Cubans high up there. It's the Mexicans where we're getting most of the advantage overall, all cancers combined. So this was a publication. Uh, and what we did was we compared all the cancer incidence rates for every single Hispanic subgroup that we could uh, identify within uh, the United States. You probably cannot see any of these numbers. Well, there is Cubans, Mexicans, New Latinos, and Puerto Ricans. Now, all of these Hispanic subgroups, they tend to have different patterns of cancer. So they all tend to have uh, higher um, infections-related cancers, with the exception of the Cuban population. The Cuban population is the one that resembles most US uh, non-Hispanic whites. Um, Puerto Ricans are a particular case in the sense that they not only have the pattern of cancer of a developed country, like all the colorectals, prostates, press, etc., but they also have these components of uh, a, country, a developing country in some ways because cervical cancer and, um, um, cervical cancer and stomach cancer, etc., are uh, relatively high. And we found that in Florida as well. We found that for males and we found that for females as well. So, very particular pattern of cancer among Puerto Ricans in Florida compared to the other ones. Unfortunately, for both sexes, the cancer incidence rates for Puerto Ricans were actually the highest of any other subgroup. More interestingly, what we also observed was that when we compare the rates between the countries of origin, and Mexico is an estimation because, as uh, Dr. Rache said before, they don't really have cancer registries. But when you compare with the estimates from IARC from the countries of origin, what we see is that for every single Hispanic subgroup studied, so here we've got the Mexicans, here we've got the Puerto Ricans, here we've got the Cubans, what we see is that the rates are always slightly lower, not slightly, substantially lower in their countries of origin. Of course, they increase by the time that they get to Florida, and then these is just the US whites or the reference population. So there is this continuous increase, and this is uh, observed both in males and females. Now, cancer per cancer, this would change, but I wouldn't have uh, space here to go through those. These are the tables that we got. At the same time that I did this with Florida data, Dr. Gloria Ho did the same with New York. So she compared the rates of cancer among Puerto Ricans in the island, Puerto Ricans in New York, and US whites. I did the same with Florida. I compared the rates that we had available for Puerto Ricans in Puerto Rico, Puerto Ricans in Florida, and then uh, US whites in Florida. And the results were amazing because they are very similar, except for one cancer, they are very, very similar. And what they show is that there is an increase. There is an increase when they come from Puerto Rico to Florida, and then another increase from Florida to the US mainland. And this is observed for most cancers, except for the cancers of infectious-related nature. Stomach cancer, it decreases. Okay? Now, there were some very interesting results, for instance, for liver cancer, which is, as you know, associated with alcohol, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, in which Puerto Ricans that move both to New York and to Florida, if they are male, they actually increase their rates, and very substantially. Whereas for females, the opposite, um, the opposite pattern was observed, which is something that has not been explained, but it, it should definitely merit some, uh, some study further into that in terms of general epidemiology. But uh, basically, what I think is worrying here really is the increase in all these numbers between the countries of origin and when people move to the United States. Because you see, we know already from acculturation that people start smoking more, they start drinking more, all these things tend to get a little bit negative. But they would not explain all this increase in all the cancers that we see. There are more things to this than what we are actually analyzing permanently in our research grants, uh, presently in our research grants, etc. One of those things is actually diet. The diet in Puerto Rico, according to Dr. Ho, is actually not better than the diet in the US mainland. It's, people are just as obese, uh, diabetes prevalence is possibly higher here, so that would not explain all this increase in all these rates here. 
So if we could focus a little bit more our research instead of this, that's where we're focusing our research now, which is the differences between Hispanics and um, whites within the United States. If you could focus our research more here, where the biggest increase is happening between what happens between the islands and uh, between the US mainland, I think we could actually get more evidence in general terms on epidemiology that could actually become idealistically an advantage for the whole country at large. So the focus should be moved a little bit in this sense. So about incidence, can we really talk about Hispanic paradox in cancer incidence? Well, it's been shown Latinos are less prone to cancer compared to whites or blacks, and this comes out just of uh, the comparison of incidence rates. So yes, we can. One of the main causes that has been proved is less smoking. The other ones, very, very, uh, suspicious to me, better diet, social cohesion, familism. The diet is a whole new world um, that should definitely merit some further research. So, incidence, yes, Latinos do have some advantage. It varies according to Hispanic subgroup. It's better for Mexicans, probably less so for Puerto Ricans. Now, can we talk about the Hispanic paradox in survival? Well, in America, it's very noble, but we have this concept of the underdog. We always want the weak person to win, which is great, and we all, it makes us all feel very good. So for the researchers, um, one piece of advice is that sometimes we take that too much far, okay? And if you want to publish a paper presently in the United States, you find some kind of advantage for Hispanics, you call it Hispanic paradox, and Gary, there you go, 80%, your paper is gonna be through, okay? So you see these news all the time, the Hispanic paradox, Latinos are doing better for this, Latinos are doing better for that. Well, they are doing better for some things, but not for all, okay? They are doing better for things like life expectancy, Latinos are doing better, Infant mortality rates, Latinos are doing better, but for cancer survival, it's an odd one. So when I saw this piece on the Los Angeles Times, I thought, mm, I've got a letter to the editor here because this is not good, this is not correct, okay? Now, and this suspicion of mine was based on a study that we did. <coughs> so basically, the Hispanic paradox says that Latinos have an advantage that is related to the, uh, despite their lower socioeconomic level. But remember that that advantage was ill-defined in terms of mortality. Now, if the Hispanic paradox is real, it means that there's more favorable health and genetic factors, familism. Now, we are not sure that it is, real. It is really real. There are many researchers that, it's, that say that it's not real. And it's explained by the healthy immigrant selection that I've already discussed, the salmon bias. The salmon bias is a bias that happens because people who are faced with an illness will go back to their countries to die. Okay? And if they go back to their countries to die, we're not going to get their death. Therefore, our numbers are, of survival are going to be inflated. And the other problem is data linkage problems. So in technical terms, how do we link the data? Are we linking them correctly? Are we actually getting as many deaths as we should? Now, this is just a map to say where people come from. Uh, Mexico, South America, Cuba, they all come to, this was in the context of Florida again. And then how do they return in terms of the bias? In terms, are we getting their deaths or not? Now, at this level, it is very important to examine this data in terms of Hispanic subgroup. Why? Because they're always different, okay? So for instance, nobody goes back to Cuba to die. If, once they are in Florida, they're gonna stay there, okay? Moreover, they're mostly documented people. We're going to get their social security number and we really are going to get their uh, death certificates. So the survival there is gonna be good. For Puerto Rico, the same thing. Even if they come back to Puerto Rico, we're going to get the death certificates as well. So in terms of quality of data for these two populations, we probably have empirically a good result. For the others, we'll never know what happened to people who went back to Mexico or to any other country of South America for that case. So in this context, we did a study together with Texas. So Texas because Texas has got a lot of Mexicans and Florida because Florida has got all the others. And that study was trying to find the difference. How does that difference between the different Hispanic subgroups contribute to the knowledge of the Hispanic paradox? And how does that difference actually impact cancer survival rates by ethnicity and by Hispanic subgroup? So what we did was very, very basic and everybody can understand. Unfortunately, these days, to this day and age, there's still a group of cancers for which there is no solution. And the outcome is gonna be fatal. Either sooner or later, there's no way out, okay? So late stage esophagus, late stage stomach, pancreas, lung, all these cancers, they are extremely bad. It's the kind of thing nobody wants to have, okay? 
Now, for these cancers, what we would expect is that many, very, very, very few people would actually survive. So we selected all these cancers for Florida, and we tried to analyze this panic paradox in this context. So is it real? We do not know. That's what we're trying to analyze. Is there going to be an healthy immigrant selection, one of the causes? Well, there is not, because once you have a late-stage cancer like this, there's nothing healthy about it, okay? unfortunately. Salmon bias is possible. And data linkage problems are possible. One of them that we wanted to, uh, to analyze was the, uh, the presence or not of a social security number. So that's what we did. And this is the final model that we have. Remember, this is just very, very bad cancers. And what we, we would suspect is that because everybody's going to die, there's not going to be very big differences between the different ethnic subgroups and the whites. Okay? And that's exactly what we see, for instance, for whites and blacks here. We've got one. This is Cox proportional hazards model, so it's an hazard ratio. One, 1.07 for blacks. Guess what? For Puerto Ricans, 0 0.96, so not significantly different from whites. That's what we would expect. For Cubans, 1.02, same thing. All very close. This is what we would expect. However, if you're Mexican, if you're Mexican, or if you're Central American, or if you're South American, or if you're Dominican, it's great to be one of these people because it seems that survival is so good. Look at this, 0 0.62, 0 0.47, 0 0.59, 0 0.48. So this just calls your attention to there's something artifactual, very strong effect going on here. It's just that we're not getting what happens to them. So the impact of follow-up in these populations is extreme. When we put the term social security number no and yes in the model, what happened was that having a social security number made your odds, made your likelihood of actually dying twice more likely, 2.1. So the moral of the story is forget your social security number is better not to have one, okay? Based on this study alone, okay? So what this shows is that what we're measuring here in terms of cancer survival for Hispanics is not very good at all, okay? When we did the age-adjusted cancer survival after five years for each of these groups, what we see is that for whites and blacks, the rates were very, very low, way below 2%. This is what we would expect. These are terrible cancers. The same thing for Puerto Ricans, the same thing for Cubans, uh, the same thing for US-born Mexicans. But every time you've got foreign-born of the other nationalities, look at these rates. It's great to be Central American with one of these bad cancers. You still have 20% chance, so let's say one in five of surviving these cancers. So just, this just goes to show how difficult it is actually to measure cancer survival within Hispanics and to apply that for the Hispanic paradox. So based on this, um, this is just a list of the problems that we have with uh, Hispanic uh, data and Hispanic data collection. Um, which makes all these problem, uh, all these uh, research questions very challenging. One of them, for instance, is complex Hispanic names. Nobody in Nevada, where I come from, knows that Maria Amelia Cruz Perez, Cruz is actually her last name. Nobody teaches anyone about this. And this makes a lot of problems in terms of death linkages at the individual level, because they'll go after the Perez instead of the Cruz when they should go after the Cruz. So things are never going to match. We're missing out all these people. The other thing is social security number and false social security number. That model that I showed up there was just for people who had some sort of social security number, so like the 000s or the 999s, okay? But the problem is that more than 10 million people in this country use a false social security number. We're never going to get those deaths. And obviously, they're mostly Hispanics and also Asians. In a new study that we're doing, we're finding that as well, a problem with Asians too. Self-identification problems. Some people just don't like to be Latino, so they will say they were born in Havana. Um, th their name is Juan Guerra, but you ask them, are you Latino? They're going to say no. So against that, you cannot say anything, OK? Misclassification, birthplace. Birthplace is like the most biased variable in the entire cancer registration world. If you ever do birthplace, be very, very careful. It's a very biased variable. And methodological limitations of other sorts. Having this in mind, and because I was coming to Puerto Rico, I gathered up some uh, colorectal cancer data that I had, and let's make the comparisons of what is actually going on for the populations that we can actually measure, which are the Puerto Ricans and the Cubans. So forget about all the rest. We've already seen that it's going to be very difficult to measure them. So let's concentrate on what we can measure. So what I did was I had an old paper from Florida, so I used that data, and I matched it up with SEER data. <coughs> now, as you know, in SEER, 
we have active follow-up, and then we have passive to follow-up, whereas in NPCR, which is Florida, we only have passive follow-up. So there was an arrangement here in which I had to postpone all the dates from SEER to a presumed live assumption. This is just a technicality, but uh, it's just important to know that we have to compare apples with apples. So what we did was we took two states from the Northeast, from the SEER data, so we have uh, Connecticut and New Jersey, lots of Puerto Ricans there. We did uh, the West Coast as well, California, Seattle, forget the why, that's a mistake, to characterize the West Coast. And then we had the data from NPCR for Florida. We had six years of data follow up to December 31, 2005. And we adjusted for all possible confounders. So, subsite, for instance, you know that Puerto Ricans and Mexicans, they tend to have color, a disproportionate number of colorectal cancers more in the rectum, whereas, for instance, whites and Cubans, they have more on the right side and on the sigmoid. So it had to be to adjusted to all those variables. Uh, we had an assumption of presumed alive for survival, and the studies, the groups that we studied were whites, blacks, Puerto Ricans, and Cubans only, because of the reasons that I mentioned before. And these were the results. We ended up with a fairly good sample of 200,000 colorectal cancers for the three regions, of which, of course, the vast majority were whites. Uh, and then we had all these variables that we adjusted for region, gender, age, morphology, subsite, and socioeconomic status, as well as stage. And the result of our model, again, this is preliminary analysis, but the results shows that for blacks, we have a hazard ratio of 1.29. This doesn't, shouldn't come as a surprise. Unfortunately, blacks are chronically <laughs> affected by disparity. But look at Puerto Ricans and Cubans. They're all significant too, 1.07, 1.6. So there doesn't seem to be uh, such an advantage to being Hispanic in terms of colorectal cancer survival. The other striking uh, aspect was that socioeconomic status was way related as we would expect, although this is at an ecological level, so at county level, but you can clearly see here um, a dose effect response if you want, to 0 0.98, 0 0.95, so we can clearly see that the fact where you live, how rich the county is, actually has a, a role in this, uh, in terms of advantage of survival, and of course, stage would vary as we would predict, in which distant stage we've got an hazard ratio of seven compared to uh, a local stage. Now, more interestingly, probably for you, we were able to analyze this region by region. Okay? So we had results for the Northeast, for Florida, and for the West Coast. And of course, these results are going to be biased by economic status. I'm sure the Puerto Rican immigration to different parts of the United States have got different, uh, different uh, characteristics. And that can have an effect in terms of the cancer survival that we observe for each of these regions. So for instance, if you look at um, California or the West Coast, what we see is that blacks do badly, 1.24, but Puerto Ricans do particularly badly there, okay? 1.27. I don't know, it's not a very large sample there, but uh, Puerto Ricans do seem to do significantly worse uh, in California than all the other groups. Cubans, by the opposite side, they do fairly well in uh, uh, on the West Coast. When we analyze uh, the Northeast, what we have is blacks at 1.22 and Puerto Ricans marginally significant at 1.09. Okay, so there is also a disparity on the, in the Northeast, whereas Cubans are doing fairly, fairly okay if you compare it just based on this. All these numbers are adjusted for all these variables that are uh, that I sent there. Finally, for Florida, this was the most surprising result for me. I didn't have uh, any expectations here. Blacks here are 1.36. This is probably underestimated. It's probably even worse than this because of the Haitian population that we're not capturing very well in terms of their death certificates. And then Puerto Ricans are, do are doing just well in Florida. They seem to do as well as the whites. I don't know why this would be, but they seem to do fairly well. Whereas Cubans have uh, 1.08 uh, hazard ratio, which is slightly worse. Um, so in conclusions, Hispanics, Cubans, and Puerto Ricans present a disparity. These are the groups that we can actually uh, assess well in terms of cancer survival. Six and seven percent, blacks much higher. The survival disparities do exist between whites and Hispanics, but we cannot see an Hispanic paradox, unfortunately, in cancer survival. 
quite the opposite. We do see um, we do see a disparity that becomes bigger when we only analyze stages for which we can do something in terms of treatment and success of uh, cancer treatment. The other point that I thought was quite interesting was that there are important ethno-regional differences. So labeling a person Puerto Rican in Florida can be very different from being Puerto Rican in the Northeast or Puerto Rican in the West Coast. So when we analyze this uh, epidemiology of what is going on in different in different parts of the, the state. It's not only the Hispanic subgroup that is important, it's also the state where they reside that can actually uh, show differences between those two. So does the Hispanic paradox apply to cancer? Well, my answer would be yes, based on lower incidence. No, based on decreased survival. And then maybe, because at the end of the day, maybe this is a much better question. Is it a Latino question or really a foreign-born question? Is it that the advantage is associated with being Latino or is it the advantage that is associated with coming from a different country, with a higher degree possibly, uh, with all the characteristics that they, they carry, the low risk for cancer, etc. So this is uh, challenging for the future in terms of research options. Uh, finally, I've just got the table here to say the evidence that we have, and for survival, for instance, for all those foreign-borns, it's impossible to know anything. In terms of incidence for Central and South Americans, we really don't have much data now. We've been doing great progress. But further progress is, um, is um, necessary. First of all, need for more research in survival disparities affecting Latinos, but much more so is the investment that we should do on the quality of data and research for Hispanics and categorizing them in Hispanic subgroups. And just as a final word, people say, oh, the Hispanic subgroups don't, don't matter anymore. Everybody's marrying each other. These days in Florida, Cuban is marrying a Colombian, etc., etc. Well, that's not really true. If you look at the demographics, the weight of people who are going to develop cancer, they're always going to be more on the foreign-born side. 60 to 70 percent at the uh, older age groups is always going to be more foreign-born. So this kind of interest in terms of Hispanic subgroup is going to persist at least for the next 50 to 70 years. This was all I had. Thank you so much.